Good evening. How are you tonight? Again, may I have the privilege and the pleasure of coming into your home to visit with you for a little while. What would you like to talk about this evening on this anonymous telephone program? What subject is of concern to you? This is a program, you know, where, uh, frankly, all of us here at Family Radio have an intense desire through a program through which this intense desire that we have for you might be realized, namely, that you might become acquainted, uh, uh, and if you're already somewhat acquainted, to become even more acquainted with this wonderful, wonderful, super important book, the Bible. And uh, we want, uh, our desire is that you might become acquainted with it, not because we're trying to build an organization, not because we're trying to develop a membership, because we are not, not because we want your money, no. Uh, those who are true believers, they will see an opportunity in all of this to uh, share the gospel with the world. But the reason we want you to become acquainted with the Bible is because it is the only place in the whole world where you might uh, be in a position where God can save you. And oh, how desperately every human being needs salvation. Salvation from what? Salvation from the wrath of God. You see, the Bible teaches that we were created in the image of God. The Bible teaches that if we disobey God, that is rebellion, that is a transgression of God's law. And God has given us the Bible as God's law book, in which he not only spells out the laws that we are to obey, but he also spells out what God's uh, what God has established as the penalty for breaking that law. And the penalty is enormous because the sin of rebellion against God is enormous. The penalty is eternal damnation, to be damned in hell forevermore. Oh, what a terrible, terrible, terrible outlook for the human race. But... There is a solution. There is a solution. God has provided in, in the Bible. He has indicated that he has chosen a great in a multitude, which no man can number. Yes, the Bible uses that kind of language, that, uh, that uh, are to become saved. We don't know who they are. We know they're sinners, though. They are those who who uh, will recognize that they are sinners and do not deserve salvation. They are those whom God has simply in his divine sovereign will decided that he would save them. And uh, you too, each one who is still not saved, could be one of these who are elected of God. And therefore, there is enormous hope on the one hand, the Bible is really underscoring the awful predicament that everyone is in, but also it is underscoring this wonderful hope that exists for those who, who uh, have, uh, uh, have not yet to become saved. And, and since the, the vehicle or the environment in, through in which God does his saving, saving people from the wrath of God, is the Bible. Therefore, a family radio, all of us have an intense desire in our love for uh, the unsaved of the world, uh, for each and every one that they too might know the Lord Jesus as their Savior want desperately that you too might uh, begin to read the Bible carefully and listen to it carefully, uh, praying that you might have some understanding, praying that you might be obedient to what we're, you're reading there. And in the process of trying to encourage you to, uh, to uh, uh, become acquainted with the Bible, uh, we also are 
are trying to help in, in teaching, and God has appointed individuals as teachers, not to rule over you, not to have some kind of spiritual supervision over you. No way, no way, not a bit, but simply to, to uh, help you to see how we are to compare scripture with scripture and as we do so we do find this truth and that truth and we can have a better understanding of what that God is teaching in the Bible and uh, and uh, not that we want anybody to trust us no way no way we simply want uh, to teach you so that you can look into the Bible for yourself and uh, and check out what you are taught on Family Radio to see for yourself whether this is true or not what you have been taught. Well, that's what our whole purpose is. Now, we have a, a question tonight that comes from South Africa. It doesn't have to do with salvation uh, directly, but it is a it's a Christmas question, as a matter of fact, and it comes. Uh, it, uh, it is a question that is a, a common one in our in the minds of many. You know, at Christmas time, we we get those Christmas cards, and you see on that card the shepherds uh, there and uh, and uh, at the crib or at the manger scene of the Lord Jesus, and we see the magi. The, we see three wise men also there, and we get the idea that all this happened right then and there that uh, evening when Christ was born. Now, it is true. The Bible is very clear that there were shepherds out in the field, and that night, that very evening, that very night that Christ was born, they were sung to by a multitude of the heavenly host, and, and they were told, go to Bethlehem, and you'll find the baby just born, just born, wrapped in swaddling clothes. And so... Uh, any any depiction of uh, of uh, uh, what happened there uh, certainly is not incorrect if it shows a manger and shows a uh, some shepherds standing there. Of course, we don't want to see a baby in that picture because the baby is the Lord Jesus, and the Bible warns us not to make any kind of an image of of God. But what about the Magi? When and the question from South Africa is this: uh, uh, Please, could I ask a question with regard to the Magi? I realize that there must have been a whole entourage of them and their assistants or helpers or servants, whoever whoever they may have been, uh, uh, that they came to Jesus and and uh, that uh, I've heard that. that uh, he had already grown into a child and was not a baby any longer. And the question is, how old was he? Uh, does the Bible give us any clues? And this is, again, uh, a, an exercise in, in looking at the Bible and recognizing that everything in the Bible is important, everything is true and trustworthy. We read in the Gospel of Matthew, in, in Matthew chapter Two, where it speaks about these magi coming into Jerusalem, and and they came to the wicked queen, King Herod, who is the king, and and since they were convinced that there was a some kind of a, a king born in uh, in Judea, and Jerusalem was the capital, logically they would come there, and so uh, Herod, we read in verse seven of he, Matthew two, when Herod. Uh, uh, then Herod, when he had privately called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. At some point earlier on, these magi had seen a special star in the heaven that was only a few hundred feet above the earth. We know it had to be that way because later on that star stood over the house where Jesus was and and therefore, if it was any higher than a few hundred feet, it would not be over a single house. It would be over a whole city. And so it was a very, very uh, miraculous, special star. And they saw this. And 
recognize that something important had happened. And anyway, to uh, get on with the question, they uh, uh, came to the conclusion that this uh, this had to do with a star, with a, the birth of a king in Judea. And so they came there. And then Herod said to them, because he had an evil plan, he wanted that that uh, that newborn king killed, if indeed uh, such a king was born. And uh, he checked with his uh, theologians, and they said, well, yes, uh, there is to be a king born in Bethlehem, and that was eight miles south of Jerusalem. And so Herod sent the, the uh, uh, Magi to Bethlehem. And he said unto them, uh, in verse 8, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when ye have found him, bring me word again, that I may come and worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, until it came and stood over where the young child was. And then uh, they uh, were warned in a dream uh, right after that, after they had uh, had paid their uh, respects and gave their gifts to the young child, uh, they left uh, Bethlehem another way and did not return to Herod. Well, after a while, Herod was uh, enormously angry because the, the uh, Magi had betrayed him and not come back to tell him where whether they had found that young child. And so... We read in uh, in uh, verse 15 of Matthew 2, and uh, 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 or verse 16. Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceeding angry, and went forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and in all the coasts thereof from two years old and under, and here's the important sentence, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. Now, in other words, he probably killed all the, uh, he, he was told that the star had appeared two years earlier, and so he killed all the children up to around two years, which would have included any, any child under three years of age. And so the likelihood Jesus was about two years old when uh, the Magi came there. Now, the reason I really got back into this question, it's really a Christmas question, but again, it is an illustration of the fact that we compare Scripture with Scripture. We don't try to get our lesson just from one verse or our conclusion, but we look around to see if there's any other verses that might apply, and then slowly on. That way we uh, finally get to the, uh, the uh, greatest uh, amount of truth possible. But thank you, South Africa, for calling that question, call, uh, raising that question. And now shall we go to our first caller on our telephone lines. Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hello, Mr. Camping. Yeah. Mr. Kaplan, I was wondering that we are all born sinners, not of our own free will, and salvation is not of our own free will. Why is it that many of us are going to hell for something that is not of our own free will? Well, we would like to conclude that we sin because of, uh, it's not because of our own free will. Let me just ask you a very plain question. The last time you knew, I don't know anything about you, or, and you don't have to tell me uh, specifically what sin it might be, but the last time you told a lie, the last time you had a lustful thought, the last time that you uh, felt angry at somebody because they had uh, betrayed you in some way, did you deliberately... Uh, tell that lie or did that just kind of slip out did you deliberately have that lustful thought or was that something that you had no control on and no, the answer is of it was course deliberate. pardon it was deliberate of course it was deliberate sin is always deliberate okay now the bible teaches that we were all in the loins of adam as in adam all die we in principle were there we are 
uh, it, we all came forth from Adam and Eve. And so when they sinned, we were there in principle also sinning. And when Eve sinned, and then Adam, he ate of that same fruit in rebellion against God, that was very deliberate sin. And then the proof that, that indeed that sin was deliberate for each of us is the moment that we're born from that point on, every sin that we do is a deliberate sin. We are in deliberate rebellion against God and and uh, and God ha that's why in God's perfect justice he must send us to hell he has stipulated that the 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 result of sin is death and he's not talking about physical death that was not the result of sin in any way uh, because if that were true then uh, then everybody would have to die before they're sent to hell and that that isn't the way it is at all uh, the fact is that physical death uh, comes because the whole world came under the curse of sin and and finally uh, the poisonous viruses and uh, bacterias and snakes and and uh, vegetables and so on that we eat uh, uh, would uh, would shorten our life and we die physically but the the death that uh, that resulted was a spiritual death so that we came under the wrath of God and that spiritual death is eternal damnation yes but uh, we are all sinners in the same way one way or another how how is it that some sinners that may be more of a sinner than I, than I am may be saved and go to heaven and some sinners like me or lesser than me may not be saved and go to hell by the well, choice well, of God, right? Well, that is that is a mystery to us. But God says in Romans chapter 9, I will have mercy upon whom I have mercy. It is God's sovereign good pleasure. Now, bear in mind... When Adam and Eve sinned, that is when all of us, because we were in principle in their loins, sinned, God should have put the whole human race into hell. We earned the, our place in hell. And God should had no obligation of any kind to save anybody. Now, God in his marvelous love and grace and mercy and uh, uh, something that's beyond our imagination decided to save a few people, let's say, a few people. Can the rest of us object to that? No. If, but in order to save them, God's justice still had to be taken care of. He couldn't just promiscuously say, well, I'm God and I, I've decided for these few people, I'm going to set aside the law, the law of God, which calls for eternal damnation for sin. I'm going to set that all aside. I'm going to simply forgive them. I'm going to waive. I'm going to uh, 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 not apply uh, the law of damnation to them. I'm going to make them my children. God could not do that because that would be a violation of the perfect integrity, the perfect justice of God. In order to save those people, it meant that somehow God had to arrange that their sins be paid for. The law demanded that payment. And so God looks around and there's nobody that can make that payment except God himself. And so God, the Lord Jesus Christ, was assigned the terrible, terrible task of, of taking upon himself the sins of those individuals and, and being found guilty for every dirty, rotten one of those sins and, uh, and having God pour out his wrath on him, the equivalent of those individuals spending an eternity in hell. Now, if he had done that for just a few people, the rest of us can object 
After all, uh, the payment has been made. Uh, these people didn't deserve it, and and but God is God, and if He wants, if He's going to do that, and if His integrity uh, and justice is going to be completely satisfied, uh, so be it. But it turns out that the number that He came to save is a great multitude, which no man can number. That's one way God speaks of it. He also speaks of it as a remnant of the because it's, a, it's still a small part of the whole human race. But nevertheless, it is uh, it in every instance, the, uh, ever, for every one of these people, Christ had to make the full payment for their sins. So it was an enormous cost. Just think of it, that Christ had to endure the wrath of God that was going to come upon a great multitude of people for each and every one of their sins, and there could be no uh, uh, withdrawal of that wrath, there could be no shortening of that wrath, there could be no limitation on that wrath. It had to be fully paid, and only because Christ was not only... Uh, 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 not only uh, not only had he taken on a human nature, but he also always remained eternal God. Therefore, he was an infinite personality. God is an infinite personality, and uh, therefore God could pour out his wrath upon him to such a degree that in the space of the hours of going into the Garden of Gethsemane and being hung on the cross and so on, God's full wrath was paid. And that is that is what is required for our salvation. And that is why, of course, any of these do-it-yourself salvation plans where people say, well, you can accept Christ, you can... Uh, you can believe on him. Uh, God has given you ability to do that. They don't have the slightest idea. These poor individuals, unfortunately, don't have the slightest idea of what was required for salvation and that and why it is, therefore, that only God can do the saving and he has to do the whole package of saving. And and that, of course, finally makes the whole situation so remarkable, so absolutely remarkable that God has done this. And today it is the day of salvation. And my, oh my, we have that impossible and wonderful, that incredible promise of Revelation 7, verse 9. I saw a great multitude which no man could number. And who are these? These are they who came out of the great tribulation. Unfortunately, our King James Bible didn't make a good translation there. They simply said they came out of tribulation. No, uh, they came out of the uh, great tribulation, that tribulation in which we are now living. So that today... There is an enormous hope for the world, an enormous hope for the world, because we're in that time of the great tribulation that comes just before Christ's return. And, and uh, so I am just thrilled that, that Family Radio can have a little part in getting the, uh, in telling people all over the world, read your Bible, read your Bible, and, and, and wait upon the Lord and pray. Uh, for his mercy and maybe you too can be will become a child of God because this is God's plan that today there is a great multitude which no man can number that are going to become saved but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum good evening brother Campbell. how yeah. are you tonight very well thank you well, Captain, I have three questions, if I might. Uh, my first question is on Leviticus 25.9. Uh, what was the book? Uh, Leviticus. Leviticus. 25.9. 25, verse 9. Let's look at that a moment. Leviticus chapter 25, verse 9. There we read in Leviticus 25, verse 9. 
Then shalt thou cause the trumpet, that is the shofar, it's not, a, it's not the silver trumpet that is spoken about in another place in the Bible. This is the ram's horn. The ram's horn of the jubilee to sound. On the tenth day of the seventh month, in the day of atonement, shall he make the ram's horn sound throughout all your land. Now, what is your question? Yeah, I saw that in, the, for example, you used so in the book uh, 1994, that you used the Jubilee as a reference to know when the Savior is coming back the second time. How, why you use the Jubilee when it's part of the Sabbath, it's part of what is uh, done away, to use it as a reference? Because, and this excuse me, you know, in the book 1994, which I wrote about 14 years ago, uh, my knowledge uh, it was not as great in the Word of God as it is today. I realized without a question that, the, that 1994 was a Jubilee year. I had that right. I realized that the Jubilee was super important. I had that right. But I, there were some things about the Jubilee I did not yet understood. God still had to make correction. And as I continue to study the Bible and study the Bible and fine-tune what I did know, I found uh, I, I have learned more and more. And I've learned that this is the second Jubilee when there would be not the, uh, the, uh, the actual return of Christ. It would be in the proximity of the return of Christ. It would herald the return of Christ. But that actually first there had to be a great multitude which no man could number that still had to be saved in that 17-year period from that jubilee year of 1994 until the year 2011, which strongly appears to be the last year of the world's existence. Yeah, uh, Mr. Camping, the, the jubilee always begins on the Day of Atonement. So to use the jubilee... You have to do away also and come back and say, well, the Sabbath is still binding because they are the Sabbath of Leviticus 23. Right there it says. Well, excuse me. No, the Jubilee does not begin on the Day of Atonement. You don't read that anywhere in the Bible. You may want to conclude that, but it's not, that is not taught in the Bible. It simply says that every 50th year was a Jubilee. And hold on, I'll be right back with you in a moment. We have a caller on the line who is asking about the Jubilee. The Jubilee uh, that God had ordained as uh, a very, very important year came every 50 years. Nowhere in the Bible does it say what point in the year did it officially begin. However, there were two days that identify with that jubilee year. One was the first day of the seventh month. Uh, and uh, that we read about in Leviticus 23, verse 24. Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first of that month, shall be a Sabbath, a memorial of now, in our King James Bible, we have blowing of trumpets. And actually, the word there is teruah, which is uh, the same word used in talking about the Day of Atonement, where it's translated jubilee. So it's a memorial of jubilee and holy convocation. We're to remember on that first day of the seventh month, therefore, uh, uh, about the jubilee year and, uh, and, uh, and, and actually... Uh, this first day of the seventh month, therefore, identifies with the Jubilee. And then ten days later came the uh, Day of Atonement that we just read about in Leviticus 25, where it, uh, it indicated that uh, the shall cause the, the uh, ram's horn of the Jubilee to, stand on, to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month. But thank you for calling and sharing. Yes, brother. Hello, yes. brother Camping. Yes. Yes. Uh, I got two more questions. Can, may I, can I do it? What is your second question? 
Yes. Uh, also, you know, the, uh, the Jubilee Brother Company is always bound to the uh, Jewish economy. There's no way to separate the Jubilee from the Jewish economy. If you read uh, Leviticus 25, you're going to see that it was bound to the land, to everything that the, the, the blessings of the Lord. So uh, in verse 9, it said, Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of the Jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month, yeah, excuse the me. day of atonement. Yeah, no, excuse me. You got to, You must remember that the Bible is a spiritual book, and Christ spoke in parables. And and the fact is that everything in the Old Testament is, or virtually everything, is appears to identify with the Jewish economy. It's talking about Jerusalem, about Judea, about the temple about uh, the building of the tabernacle, and, and so on, and so on. And yet we learn in, from the book of Hebrews that all of these were patterns that, uh, 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 that were anticipating what salvation is all about. In other words, they would be carried out all the way through the New Testament era. And so when we read about these things, we don't say, well, that was for the Jews. That's not for us. No way. The whole, all Scripture, remember the Bible says, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that is for teaching, for correction, for uh, reproof, and for, training, or, and for training in righteousness. And so when we read about the Jubilee, it wasn't for the Jews, as, for the Jews as a, alone. As a matter of fact, it's very significant. When you go through the whole Bible with a fine-tooth comb, you will not find that in any year did the Jewish people celebrate a Jubilee year. Now, maybe they did, but God does not record it anywhere, anywhere. And, and more than that, when we look at the other feast days, for example, like Pentecost, now, uh, that was a Jewish celebration uh, that was to be observed uh, 50 days after the, sa the uh, Sabbath that immediately followed the Passover. And, and, uh, and yet, after God was finished with the nation of Israel, and he, uh, at the time when Christ went back to heaven, and when he poured out the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2, it was in the New Testament era. It was after Christ had gone back to heaven and, and he was no longer using the synagogues or the temple in his divine economy. And that occurred on Pentecost, which was a Jewish, uh, that is, it was indicated in the Bible as one of the Jewish feast days. Therefore, this, by the same token, the Jubilee year, while it is, it is spoken of in connection with the Jewish economy, actually is God's plan for his whole salvation plan. And it goes right on on. And, and there's no statement in the Bible that the Jubilee would not continue. Uh, and so that when we are talking about 1994 as a Jubilee year, well, that's, that follows the 50-year program that God had established. So if you're going to build your argument that, that the Jubilee year had, only was for the Jews, it will not wash. But, but thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Uh, good evening, Mr. Camping. Yes. Um, I have a couple of uh, uh, issues that I'd like to raise with you. Yes, go ahead. And uh, the, the first issue concerns your answer to uh, two callers ago who indicated, who asked the question, why is it that some people are going to be saved and others are not? And I believe from the scripture that that these questions cannot be answered. And um, night after night, I see you attempting to answer many questions that are not answerable, despite all the information that's revealed in the Scripture. Uh, excuse example, me, excuse me, before you go on, let me try to uh, respond to what you have just said. 
What was the answer that I gave when uh, they asked the question, uh, uh, how is it that God saved this one or, and not saved that one? Uh, I, I simply gave the biblical answer. Here's what God says in Romans chapter 9. This is a voice. This is the word of God, not my word. This is what God is saying. He says in verse 15, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. I'm going to... F- Let's see once more what God says. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor him of him that runneth, but of him that showeth mercy. And we can't do better than that. I mean, then to quote from the very mouth of God. And uh, I have never attempted to say why he chose some and not others. I have simply repeated what the Bible says. Mr. Mr. Camping. Uh, we 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 have read that, and uh, many people have read that. Are not, and you you in particular have shown us that it's, things in the Bible are not always clear. In fact, most of the things are not clear. The point I'm I'm trying to make is that if we're understanding that our faith value, it means that here we have a father who has a whole world of disobedient children, and. They went off somewhere and they are all drowning. And he, and he has the ability to. He has the power to save them all. And he says, I'm only going to choose these. I'm a father of seven children, Mr. Campion, and I'll tell you, if I told my children not to go swim in the pool and they all go and they're drowning, and if I am able to save them all, I will, and I know that I'm not more righteous than God. So, so therefore, we don't, we clearly, we don't understand what Romans uh, 9 excuse is saying. Excuse me, excuse me, now excuse me. Let's, uh, the, the problem is that this is not a matter of emotion. You have, uh, the, you, you're speaking about emotion. Oh, I'm the father of seven children. I love them all, and I would not want to see any of them lost. Of course, I can agree with you that we're about that. As a matter of fact, God shows emotion. He says uh, that he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. But he even he develops that even more as he looks at Jerusalem, which he is going to destroy because of their wickedness. Christ wept. Now, remember, Christ is eternal God. And he wept over Jerusalem. How oft I would have gathered you as a hen gathered you as chicks, and ye would not. And yet he goes, even though he's weeping over the fact that he has, is that they're under the wrath of God, he is going to go ahead and destroy them. Why? Why? Because God is a God of law. He is a God that has perfect integrity. And he, even though emotionally, it is an enormous distress to God that he has to send anyone to hell. He must send them to hell if their sins have not been paid for. And God clearly indicates that there were certain ones that God had chosen to become saved, and therefore he had to pay for their sins, but he never did plan to pay for the sins of everybody. We read in Ephesians chapter 1, and we have to let God tell us. We can't let our emotions tell us. Uh, 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 God uh, has emotions too, but God is under the same law that we are under. God cannot have just any old kind of a plan because he's emotionally uh, uh, unhappy that he has to send people to hell. That's He has to follow the law of God. This is a fact that has not been, been, uh, been uh, in, included in the message of salvation that's been going out to the world. God is a God of law. And he is a God of perfect integrity. 
Uh, and and if God would, because he's emotionally upset because he's got to send someone to hell. And if he finally says, oh, I can't do it. I just can't send that person to hell. I love him too much. I'm going to... I, I'm going to bring him with me to heaven. And if he had not paid for the sins of that individual, he would be a God with no integrity. It would mean he would be a God of sin. He would be rebelling against the very law of God that he had established. And therefore, from that point, nobody could trust him. He could change his mind about any law that he had. But because he's a God of law, he has to send these people to hell. Uh, whether he likes it or not, he must do that. And that also guarantees that when he makes promises to us in his word, which, and remember, his word is the law of God, it also means that he has to keep those promises. When he says, I've given you eternal life, if you have become a child of God, then it is eternal life. We will never, never, never lose our saved relationship with God. If he says, I'm going to come as the judge on the last day, and he's established that timeline when he's coming, he's got to follow through on that. He cannot change that. This is a concept of God that mankind has not had. We try to make God the kind of God like we are, like like we like human judges who can say, well, I know the law says that this criminal has to has to have this happen to him and so on and so on because he's broken a law but I just I, I'm a man of mercy and I, I, I can't go through it therefore I am not going to make the demand on this individual that the law calls for that law would be the, or that judge would be an unrighteous judge that judge would have no integrity he's been appointed judge to carry out the law of the land and God is perfect in his justice. So I'm sorry. I know. I know that we're upset when we in our emotions think about this terrible thing of, of, of uh, God's wrath. But we have to remember that God, too, is a God of emotion. But God is also a God of perfect law and oh can we be thankful for that because that's an enormous guarantee for, uh, for and security for every true believer and also for God's whole salvation plan that he must carry out but thank you for calling and sharing and you know these are these are thoughts or these are principles rather these are principles right out of the bible that have never really been taught all kinds of people uh, uh, look at what god christ did at the cross and they haven't the slightest idea how that fits into the law of god they have never we've never been taught that god is a god of law a God of law. He must keep that law. He cannot. If, if he would break that law in the slightest way, then he would be a God of sin, and, and the, uh, we would have no trust at all in him any longer. But he will never sin. He is a righteous God, and therefore we know he's got to send people to hell if he has not paid for their sins. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Yes, Mr. Camping, I called you last month and I asked you kind of this question, and it kind of segues into the question that was just asked. And my question last time, and if you could just help me understand this, was uh, you often make... Uh, uh, analysis or you you talk about stories 
that are from the Bible and you say they are a picture of salvation or they're a picture of God's law or they're a picture of God's wrath. And my question is, is there a, a picture of someone in the Bible who wants to be saved but God tells them no? You can't be saved because I don't see that in there. And I think sometimes, Mr. Camping, you, and I, and, and with all due respect, I get the impression that you have a, a very, uh, you're so uh, uh, concerned that people will not take the salvation thing for granted that you, you, you don't, you don't seem to, to incorporate that there is a difference between the people in the world who have no interest, people in church who say they have an interest, but really are not sincerely pursuing spiritual things, and then people who sincerely are pursuing spiritual things, and perhaps it is because they have been called or have been chosen. So is there a picture in the Bible of a person who asked to be saved, but God rejected them? Well, but God does even better than that. You know, when we are learning truth through the pictures and portraits and types that God uses, and and we do learn a whole lot through that, but sometimes God comes out with very plain language, very plain language, so we don't even have to look for a picture. In Romans chapter 3, this is what God says. Now, these, these words are from the mouth of God. They're not my words. This is what God is saying. In verse 10, Romans chapter 3, as it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. All right, now we stop right there. We say, now wait a minute. Now, uh, this is what God is saying? How can we understand that there's none that seeketh after God? Why all kinds of people want to get right with God? Yes, you see, as we read more in the Bible, we find that the Bible says that man was created in the image of God. God is God. We have a knowledge that there is a God. God. (coughs) Excuse me. Even the most pagan man knows there is a God. When when they find, for example, some of these Stone Age people in the jungles of Borneo or the jungles of of Guinea, New Guinea, or wherever they may be, it's surprising. But they have law, and they and they believe that there's some kind of a spirit world, and there's some kind of a a God that they have to answer to. This is because man was created that way. That is the natural condition of man, that there is a God. And because God's law is written on their heart, the Bible tells us, God, mankind knows somehow I've got to get right with God. Now, here we have a world that is has hundreds and hundreds of different religions there's the buddhist religion the hindu religion there's the uh, mohammedan religion the catholic religion the baptist religion the methodist religion the uh the reformed religion the presbyterian go on i go uh, the mormon uh, the jehovah witness the seventh day you can go on and on and on with with all kinds of religions and what is the purpose of each and every one and some of them are very more pagan than others some of them have some identification with the bible but they all have one desire and that is somehow that through that religion i can get into a right relationship with god i can get into a right relationship with god that is the desire of men those who who uh, are even more intelligent and and recognize that to have a that uh, that not only do they have to get into a right relationship with God but that if they don't they're going to be under the judgment of God for certain uh, may even become atheists or evolutionists so that they try to believe with all their heart there is no God there is no God and and uh, so they deceive themselves in that way because every human being knows somehow I've got to get right with God. 
and uh, and so they choose what they think would work best. Maybe it's the Baptist gospel where if you accept the Lord Jesus, uh, then you will become right. Or maybe it's uh, uh, the Church of Christ where if you get baptized in water, then you have come into a right relationship with Christ. And so everyone chooses something, but none of them will fit the the definition of the Bible. The Bible says, there's none that seeketh after me. Is God missing the point here? Is he telling us a lie? Of course not. Of course not. That is, there is none that seeketh after God in a way that is pleasing to God. It's because in our sin, we want to do it. We have to figure it out. And God is saying, no, it won't work that way. Listen to me. Listen to me. I have chosen certain ones to become saved, and you wait upon me. And the environment in which I'm going to save these that I have chosen is the hearing of the Word of God. God says that plainly in Romans 10, verse 17. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. And this is the way you see that God has laid out his plan. And so when you ask the question, well, where does the Bible uh, tell us that someone really was trying to get saved and God says, no, I'm not going to save you, That's, that, that doesn't enter the equation. Everybody somehow wants to get right with God. But by God's definition, nobody is seeking him. They want to seek God on their own terms. And... Uh, and and that's why it's so abhorrent to most people in the world when we come with the true message of salvation and tell people, you can't do anything about it. That's abhorrent to mankind. I want to do something. I, I have, to be, have to be in charge of this. And God says, no, no, no. You're dead. You're spiritually dead. You're a corpse. And, and you're, you're, you have, there's no possibility. In fact, he, remember what Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 44, No man can come to me except the Father draw him. In other words, God is going to irresistibly bring those into the kingdom of God that God wants to plant, bring into the kingdom of God. Mr. Camping, hello, yes. hello, yes. Mr. Camping, yes. Mr. Camping, I understand what you're saying, and if you'll just give me a little time to, to just discuss this with you before you disconnect me, I want to use your own description of people who are saved have an intense desire to do the will of God, and when we say someone who wants to be saved. I'm not debating whether or not uh, election is the issue. So if you have someone who God has elected and they want to be saved, and then they are going to want to be saved because they have been elected. They have a new resurrected soul. They have an intense desire to be obedient to God. This is a person who wants to be saved, not because they want to get right with God like your description before so much, but if they've been elected, if they've been chosen, and they have an intense desire to be obedient and to do the will of God, then there's just natural desire to want salvation. Well, now, excuse me. Let me interrupt a moment. It's it, By the time they have been given a new resurrected soul, they are saved. They are saved. And they're saved not because they had a, a, a better in, in knowledge of wanting to become saved. It is because God chose them. And, and let me use the illustration again. And it's an, a tremendously wonderful illustration of John 11. Here is Lazarus, physically dead, a stinking corpse. God commands him to come forth. Just exactly as we are before we're saved, we're spiritually a stinking corpse. We're dead. God commands us to believe on him. He commands us to repent. He commands us to seek him. Uh, It's no different. The parallelism is very, very accurate. And yet, and so how in the world is Lazarus going to come out of that tomb? 
He's a stinking corpse. He can't come out. He cannot come out. He's a dead person. But he does come out. Now explain, how did that happen? How did he obey that command? Because he, he had been saved. God had chosen him. Excuse me, no. It's the, uh, this is a physical situation. This is a, uh, God is using that as an illustration of salvation. That God gave him physical... Christ had to enter into that tomb and give that stinking corpse physical life and a will to respond and, and, the, and the strength to respond. And so he came out. And that's the way God commands us. He says, you've got to be saved. You've got to turn to Christ. You've got to uh, believe on him. You've got to repent. And nobody can do that. And yet here's one that does, or there's one that does. What happened? God had to enter into that person's life and save that person. And now he has, uh, is a new creature in Christ. Now he has been given eternal life. Now he has an intense desire to do the will of God. Hold on, I'll be right back with you right after this message. We're continuing with the open forum. We have a caller on the line. Go ahead with your call. Yes, um, Mr. Camping, just a little bit further, if you'll just help me out here. Um, you're, okay, so what I'm saying is if you have been chosen... And you often say that you don't know when you were chosen, probably as a baby, because you believe you've been saved or that you were elected from the very as early as you can remember. I've also heard you tell callers that um, you may not know instantly that it's not necessarily a, a, a snap of the finger and you know you've been saved, that sometimes it's a gradual thing. So if we apply all of that, if you had to have been elected, if you um, and if you are elected and it's not a, something that you know that you've been saved but you you find yourself wanting to be saved you find yourself uh, studying God's word wanting to be obedient an intense desire to be obedient at some point maybe you will get that that clarification uh, in fact based on your studies and based on the Bible you will get clarification that you are uh, saved, but that doesn't exclude that you may not want it at some point. Because if you have been saved, if you are elected, you do desire. You may not know that you've been elected, but there's a part of you that's transformed, that's, been, that's different, that wants to be obedient, that is begging God, like you ask people to, to beseech Him for salvation. That doesn't exclude you from necessarily having been chosen if you don't know, but you're wanting well, to be ex saved. Ex oh, excuse me, you, we don't have to become quite that complicated. The fact is, God gives us a commitment. He says in 1 John chapter 3, verse 9, that which is born of God cannot sin. Now, if we're born, if we're saved, we have been born of God in our new soul, in our soul existence, our spirit essence. We have been born of God. And there's no halfway being born of God or partly way being born of God. We are either unsaved altogether, both in body and soul, or instantly at the moment of salvation, we receive our brand new resurrected soul and there will be an intense desire to do the will of God. However, uh, uh, God does give us no, no uh, information as to what that moment might be. This is, some, this is a miracle that God performs in the life of everyone he saves and it's done unbeknownst to that individual. The only thing we find out is that there is a reaction to that in that there is increasingly a desire to do the will of God. All right, now, here we have another problem. Here is a person who has lived as an, un an unsaved person. That's true of every one of us before we're saved. We are, our, our uh, life attitudes and, and everything about it are all conditioned 
uh, by our unsaved mind and our unsaved body. We really want our own will. And intellectually, we may, uh, if we have been uh, reading the Bible quite a bit and pondering the Word of God quite a bit, we may have become to under, may have come to understand some of the truths of the Bible, a little here, a little there, but they have never really made any uh, decisive impact upon our life. Now I become saved. And and it doesn't mean now that in my soul I know all the laws of God. I know uh, how am I to live. The Bible talks about growing in grace. The Bible talks about hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And And what happens at the moment I became saved is that unbeknownst to me, but increasingly uh, I will find in my life a hungering and thirsting after righteousness. I will have an increasing desire to, to correct this in my life and that in my life and so on. And, and after a while, uh, and it may be soon or it may be a little later, I'm going to be, as I'm reading the Bible and, and uh, pondering and, and praying for righteousness, I'm going to recognize, you know, you know, the Bible says that if we become saved, we will keep his commandments. And that is my desire to keep his commandments. And I find that this is more and more constant in my life. And I'm finding uh, to my utter delight that I delight in the word of God more than I ever have. And so it doesn't mean that I've been slowly on growing uh, to become saved or, or that God solely on is saving me. No, I was completely saved at the moment that God, uh, that God applied that word to my life and made me an, uh, his child, made me a new creature in Christ to use the language of the Bible, gave me a new resurrected soul to use the language of the Bible. And, and, uh, and, uh, and, but the impact or the knowledge of that, slow, I would slowly on become aware of. And because it is all the work of God, it will, it will be there and will not change. It will constantly develop. If, for example, I, f I went through a period of, of, uh, for a few years where I really thought I had a desire to do the will of God, and then I would fall away and get go back into my old habits of sin. And then that would be very clear to me. No, no, I've never become a child of God because I, that God doesn't do it that way. If I became a child of God, it meant that he, he, he locked me in with a, a, a brand new resurrected soul. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Bracampion. Yes. Please, I have two questions. One about uh, Sunday service. Well, we say the church age has ended. And in that wise, I would think one is constantly hearing the Word of God on a daily basis. But the Word of God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. My question in that regard is, after observing maybe fellowship with others, is it all right to go out shopping on that day or do some other things that you want to do on that? Well, now you see, yeah, you're, I think you're asking the question, how are we to observe the Lord's day, the Sunday Sabbath that God has given us? And we read, of course, in... Uh, Isaiah 58, verse 13, that it's not to do our will, but to do God's will. Okay, you're going to go shopping. And, and more than that, when God uh, gave us an illustration of how a holy day ought to be kept, uh, and he uh, talked about the seventh-day Sabbath. Now, it's true the Sunday Sabbath is not the seventh-day Sabbath, but nevertheless, we can take some lessons from that. Because when God is saying you're not to do any, any of your pleasure and any of your work on the seventh day Sabbath, he says, neither are you to have your uh, servants or your animals do any work on that day. Uh, you, uh, you are to desire 
in other words, you don't want to put them in a situation where they're breaking the law of God. And so if we apply that to the Sunday Sabbath, then we have two issues. Shall I go shopping on Sunday? Well, now the first issue is that am I doing this to please God? I, am I really doing this because I, I'm worshiping God and, 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 or am I shopping because that is my good pleasure? It's a convenient day. I've got time. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and while I'm shopping, uh, am I really growing in grace? Am I really learning from the Word of God? Am I meditating upon the Word? And of course, of course not. Secondly, it means that really I'm asking all those store uh, employees to work on my behalf so that even though they don't care about the Sunday Sabbath at all, nevertheless they're in a position where they too are breaking the law of God concerning the Sunday Sabbath because the law of God applies to everybody. So if I'm a true child of God, I'm going to minimize that kind of activity as much as possible for my sake as well as for the sake of others who, uh, who would become involved in that kind of activity if I did my shopping on that day. Okay, thank you for that. Um, but uh, if it's got to say one can't do any other thing on that Sunday, I'm sorry, repeat I mean, that. It, it is not to say one cannot do any other thing on a Sunday, apart from just sharing the Word of God. Well, the Sunday is an enormously wonderful day to share the Word of God with others. And there are those who make it a practice, and I think it's a delightful practice. Of Sunday afternoon, they get a bunch of tracks. Uh, Family Radio provides them free of charge. Does God Love You tracks? And... 20 different languages or more and uh, they go to uh, this section of town or that section of town and depending on uh, the, the normal language of the people there they are there standing passing those kind of tracks out that is they are witnessing the Lord Jesus Christ and I think that's a, a wonderful activity for, the, for Sunday activity Okay, second question, please. Uh, the second question is about um, tithing. Actually, I've had you give an answer to that before, but my other question is with regards to the emphasis the current church um, organizations, are, well, I'll say, plays on tithing and uh, as compared with what Jesus Christ said in the Bible with regards to the woman who gave her all to... to uh, pennies and she, he said the woman gave everything she had um, my question is is there really any need to lay emphasis on people giving a tithe a tenth of everything they earn a tenth of their salary or just giving and giving cheerfully because most people who have to give tithe find it difficult uh, maybe after giving it they go back yeah and... I'm, I'm sorry for some reason i'm having a hard time following you and i'm really not a, able to answer your question because i have not been able to uh follow you through and so i'm sorry maybe you could call another time uh and and uh, try once more but thank you for calling and sharing and shall we take our next call please good evening welcome to open forum yeah, brother Camping, I'm calling again because I couldn't finish the question that I have. Uh, and uh, please don't be rude and cut me off. Uh, uh, is, otherwise, you can tell the people, if you agree with me, call the open forum. If you disagree, don't call. You know, that you can say that. Otherwise, don't invite the, the listeners to call because not everybody agrees with you. Well, but the, the, uh, we never tell anybody that they can't call, but it's not a matter of whether they agree with me or not. The issue is, do they agree with the Bible? Uh, you know, if people come just with an opinion, or what, this is what our church teaches, well, that, doesn't, that, uh, that has no authority. They've got to come with, if, they're, if, they're, if they want to advance a uh, doctrine of some kind that they hold, they have to have biblical basis for it. Biblical basis for it. 
And, and by the same token, when I advance an idea, uh, I better have biblical basis for it, because just ideas or philosophies or what seems to be uh, reasonable won't wash. Not, not, not on this kind of a program. We are, are, this program is designed to find out what is God's law. What does God have to say about it? And once we believe we understand what God has to say, then we can then we can talk about it. But thank you for calling and sharing. And shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Hi. Um, when I'm trying to understand the way that God sees um, the world and the universe, it's it's very hard for me to grasp um, the fact that. I'm not supposed to use my own logic and reasoning when I'm trying to understand what the way God sees things. Um, and part of that is because when I look at the way that Jesus answered questions, he didn't answer every single question by quoting scripture. He did use logic and reason to answer some of the people's questions. Um, for example, the denarius. Um, also, he constantly said, you people, why don't you get it? Why don't you understand what I'm saying to you? So it seems to me that God wants us to be thinking hard about what he's saying and trying to fit the puzzle together. Okay, well, now, that's an interesting concept that you're offering, but bear in mind, Jesus is God. Jesus is God. Whenever he spoke... That is the law of God that he is indicating. He's not just saying, this is logical to me or this is reasonable to me. He is enunciating the law of God because he never ceased to, to be God. However, we're not God. We, uh, If we're going to bring the truth, we have to find out what the law of God is because that is our ultimate authority. That is, if we're going to bring, bring truth in, concerning any matter that identifies with the Bible, we have to f find it in the Bible. We can't trust our minds. Uh, in fact, the Bible talks about the wisdom of the world, which uh, which makes, uh, they think that, that preaching the true gospel is foolishness because there's such a vast chasm uh, a vast gulf that exists between the wisdom of the world and the and the wisdom of God. Uh, the world thinks the wisdom of God is foolishness, but in actuality, it's the, exactly the opposite. The the uh, and the Bible further explains that the wisdom of the world is foolish, and and it's the wisdom of God that is altogether trustworthy. Right. Um, and then, so, Jesus, Jesus is God, that's why he can say what he says. Yes. But, um, when Paul talks in his letters, he is not God, even though God is writing through him. Paul, um, has a personal habit, contrary to other, um, scribes of the Bible, that Paul uses logic and reason much more than other writers in the New Testament. All right, now excuse me. Now let's stop right there. That's a good point that you're making. A val or let me say it's a valid point that you're trying to make. The fact is that you have answered your question. Paul is the scribe. He is speaking the words that God is giving him to speak. And when God wrote the Bible... If we, the more we study the Bible, intensely study the Bible, we find that God very deliberately, very deliberately wrote the Bible so that it would be at times very confusing and at times uh, give apparent contradictions and, at, and, and give uh, uh, people who are not trusting the Bible as God's word alibis for believing the way they 
uh, they wanted to believe. Jesus, for example, said very candidly, I have spoken in parables so that seeing they will not see and hearing they will not hear. Wow! God, Christ, who is God himself, is saying it absolutely plainly to us. He wrote the Bible to keep people in unbelief, in their spiritual blindness. And, and so we have to be aware of that. And so as we read the Bible, when, we, when, uh, when uh, Paul uh, uh, is being used of God to utter the words of God, and he says, well, uh, I, uh, I say this, not my Lord said that, uh, we say, oh, well, then that's just an opinion of Paul. No way, no way. He said that because God said that, but it's an addition to what Christ actually said when Christ spoke about marriage. It doesn't mean that it is of lesser authority or that it was conditioned just by Paul's thinking. No way. It, uh, we, we, we don't want to fall into that trap, into that snare, that there's anything in the Bible that, uh, that, uh, that uh, is, uh, is not from God. But thank you for calling and sharing, and shall we take our next call, please? Good evening. Welcome to Open Forum. Good evening, Mr. Gampin. Yes. Uh, I would like to make uh, two questions. First, I would like you to read uh, Matthew five seventeen to 19. Matthew and 5, Hebrews. verse 17. Let's look at that. Matthew yes. five seventeen to 19. Yes, we will. Let's, we read there. Uh, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one jot or tittle shall in any way pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Whosoever, therefore, that shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now, the, other one, the other one is Numbers 23, 19, and 20, please. Numbers uh, 23. 19 and 20. All right, let's look at that. 23, 19, and 20. There God says, God is not man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. Hath he said, and shall he not do it? Or hath he spoken, and shall he not make it good? Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. And the last scripture is Deuteronomy 4.13, please. Uh, De Deuteronomy 4, 413. verse 13. All right, let's look at that. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 13. Uh, there we read... And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform, ten commandments, and he wrote them upon two tables. All right, the question is, Mr. Kempin, we read here three scriptures, two in the Old Testament and Matthew in the First Testament, beginning, Think now that I come to change. And it ends that until heaven and earth shall pass, no one jot, no one tittle. And earlier we have, you, I heard you speaking about the Sunday Sabbath, which is as fine. But what surprised me that you use scripture from the seventh day Sabbath to fall in the first day Sabbath. So now, don't you think if Christ of God would have made a Sunday Sabbath like you so call it, he would not call us some blessing for that day too? Where does it say in the scripture that the blessing was transferred from the Saturday Sabbath to the Sunday Sabbath? Please well, read it. Excuse me. The, the problem is, uh, you know, uh, God has given us his law, and his law declares. In uh, Revelation chapter 22, verse 18, if we add to the words of the prophets, prophecies of this book, I will add to you the plagues written herein. And if you take away from the words of the prophecy of this book, I will take away your share in the tree of life. Now, for example, 
there are those like, for example, the Seventh-day Adventists. And they have a church founder named Ellen G. White who believes she has received certain visions from God. And that church has decided that they, too, are inspired and therefore are to be listened to as the law of God. And so right at the beginning, they are in complete violation of Revelation 22, verse 18, where we're not to add to the words of the prophecy of this book. And and not only are they in complete violation, but it means, therefore, they're still under the plagues. There, there is no salvation. Thirdly, because they have added to the law of God through the writings of Ellen G. White, now they are reading the Bible and the rest of the law of God in the light of their divine authority, which is not only the Bible, but also the writings of Ellen G. White. For example, she received a vision where there was a halo around the fourth commandment. That was big time for them. This meant, oh my, that seventh-day Sabbath is big, important. Uh, has an enormous importance in some way. And because they have a, a different authority, because they are not inspired, that is, they're not being led by God any longer because they're under the plagues of God, of course they come to all kinds of misunderstandings with uh, statements in the Bible concerning the law of God, concerning the seventh-day Sabbath. They They... They come up with all kinds of ideas that are contrary to the law of God. We can expect that all together. And even though they use verses from the Bible, uh, uh, they, don't, they cannot understand them because the, God is not working in their hearts. The only way we can understand, truly understand something, is if God is giving us a spiritual uh, eyesight if he is opening our understanding and so that's why that's why uh, uh, when God uh, talks about the Ten Commandments yes they are the the law of God along with the whole Bible it's not just the Ten Commandments the whole Bible is and in the Ten Commandments God does say that uh, uh, that uh, uh, we're to keep the seventh day, but uh, but the law of God also stipulates that that was a sign pointing to the fact that we're not to try to get ourselves saved by our own efforts. But thank you for calling and sharing. And uh, shall we take our well? We don't have time for our last call. We've come right to the end of our time. Uh, the Lord willing, we will be back together again, uh, uh, Lord willing, uh, next Monday night. And in the meanwhile, let's keep reading the Bible. And I, I have to say that to myself just as well as I say it to you. And always remember that as we read the Bible, we should be praying for wisdom from God so that we might have some understanding and even more than that, that we might be obedient, altogether obedient to what we find there. Until our next open forum, may the Lord richly bless you. Good night. <laughs>